So I, I'm, I'm presenting a, a, a work that we, we just completed, but uh, which builds up on, on a fairly long study in, uh, in, uh, in Northern Gannets. Uh, so the, the, the paper will be online in the, in the next few uh, weeks. And uh, the, the background of, uh, of the study is a, is a fairly classic one since we are seabird ecologists and we, we work on a, on a vanishing uh, community. Um, as, as you can see here, the, uh, the world seabird community has been declining steadily over the, uh, well, that's more or less across my lifetime, um, um, reducing by about half in, in these four decades we consider here. And, and this decline has uh, many causes. The, uh, the, the main one is, is habitat loss um, and also invasive species on, on islands and, and bycatch. Uh, but as you can see here, competition with fisheries um, is also, also has a, an incidence um, because we demonstrated that across these four decades, there was a, a steady competition uh, with fisheries. Um, so global fisheries targeting seabird prey continue to, uh, to exert uh, pressure. And, um, and because of all of this, um, many species of, of seabirds are, are declining, and this concerns mainly albatrosses, petrels, penguins, and, and terns. Uh, but other species actually still do relatively well, or even, uh, even thrive. And uh, it might be interesting in, in, in knowing how these species function, how they manage to be resilient in, uh, in these anthropized systems, or at which point uh, there is a breaking point and they don't do uh, that well. Um, so that's why it's interesting to focus on the, on the northern gannet. Um, it's, uh, it's the largest uh, seabird in, in the North Atlantic uh, with uh, about three kilogram body mass, 1.8 uh, meter wingspan. So it's, it's physically dominant in multi-species feeding aggregations. Uh, if you watch this, at sea, you know, when a, when a gannet comes into a feeding flock, um, the other species go, go away because they don't want to be uh, hit by uh, its large beak. And um, so um, the, the, the gannet also has this capacity to, uh, to forage on a wide range of prey. Um, and also it dives quite well. So it's, it's not only a subsurface feeder, it, it can go down to 30 meters to, uh, to target prey if, uh, if necessary. And, and that gives it a, a lot of flexibility at targeting resources, um, even if it becomes scarce, especially because it's, it's quite uh, wide uh, ranging. Yeah, I showed one of the first studies which followed northern gannets um, in the North Sea. So you, you have here the, the UK uh, the North Sea, and you can see that um, uh, northern gannets from Bass Rock near Edinburgh are really wide uh, ranging. Um, so they, they, are, they are good sailors and they can use resources uh, within a range of about 500 kilometers, much farther than, for instance, Alcid um, breeding in Scotland, which are more constrained by, by local resources. So because all of this, uh, the northern gannet is really considered as highly uh, as a highly uh, resilient species. And uh, the late Brian Nelson summarized this in his uh, um, 1978 book, uh, The Gannet, he, he says, it takes a lot to starve a gannet. Uh, so the gannets, they go at sea after the breeding season. And when they come back at the end of winter, they're really fat, uh, fat and, and powerful birds. Uh, historically, as most seabirds in Europe, uh, gannets were hunted. Uh, and that kept the, uh, their populations artificially low, uh, probably for, for centuries. Um, here it's an example from uh, Skulaske in, in the Outer Hebrides, uh, where gannets were ex exploited. And, um, and these low uh, numbers um, were maintained until about the middle of the uh, 20th century. Uh, but from then, and also with the European Bird Di Directive in 1978, uh, populations um, started to, uh, to increase again. Um, I've taken here just uh, an example uh, extracted from the, the counts uh, Stuart Murray, Sarah Wanless, and Mike Harris are making for um, gannet colonies in, in Scotland. And, and those are the colonies which are fairly recent, so established during the, the second half of the 20th century. 
And you can see that they're all nicely increasing, especially um, uh, during the last, uh, the last decades. And at the scale of the UK, you have a very healthy growth rate at uh, about uh, 4%, so it's 3.7 uh, to be accurate. So um, all in all, you, know, you, you get the impression that uh, gannets are, are doing well. And, and to me, this was always a, a kind of a surprise because especially in the UK, they're surrounded by seas which are heavily fished. Um, and you sometimes wonder you know, how such big birds and in, in big numbers uh, manage to acquire resources. Um, because we, we work in, in, in France, um, we are interested in the one uh, gannet colony on, on the French uh, territory. Uh, with the exception of a, a few nests uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, it's the, uh, the Rusic uh, breeding colony, which is the southernmost uh, breeding site for northern gannets in the eastern Atlantic. Uh, there, there are also uh, northern gannet colonies in, uh, in Quebec. And uh, this, um, this colony on, on Rusic Island um, established just before the Second World War, um, and it has been growing steadily. Uh, so, as you can see here, you have the, the log uh, of colony size in terms of apparently occupied nests here. Um, and, and you see that there are few counts for the first decade or so. Um, but, but then, you know, you have this steady increase of the colony um, with five, six, uh, 6, 8.5, and then 4% as UK colonies. So, everything is, is doing well, and you have this wonderful cloud of big blackbirds in front of, of uh, Peros de Hac, um, and, and that's within the, uh, the nature reserve of a setil, uh, which is managed by, uh, by LPO. And, uh, and because you know, the, the, the birds are there, they really attract that attention, and, uh, and they become a, a sort of national emblem uh, for, for seabirds. Um, and, and one starting point for this, it's, it's not only because the colony is there, but it's because already 30 years ago, there was a, a camera on, on the island uh, with a remote link to the uh, LPO station on Ile Grand. And so uh, people were, were able a long time before webcams or, or everything like that to, uh, to show the birds on, on the nest. And, and already 30 years ago, uh, this video was broadcasted live on national television um, each, each evening. And, uh, and through this, the Gannets were really gained notoriety. And from there, streams of tourists started to come, uh, not only to the L LPO station in Il Grand, but also uh, to come to the Setil uh, on, on the small vessels to uh, visit the archipelago. Uh, so we have a real uh, national emblem there for, for marine biodiversity. And as I was there at the Setil last, last June, there was a, a, a TV crew each single day to come and, and film the birds. So it's a, so it's a big thing and brings a, a lot of resources uh, region, regionally. Um, we come in here as, uh, as scientists um, because we are curious about what, what the birds are doing. And on the other side, on the manager's side, uh, there's also the need to know what the birds are doing at sea because they are protected on land. Uh, but for a long time, there was actually little knowledge about what they were doing at sea. And so we, we have this very nice uh, collaboration with, uh, with uh, LPO and the, the reserve managers, uh, starting with Francois Sciorra and, and then Mélanie Lemus and, and lately um, Pascal Provo, that's the guy on, on the left. And uh, Pascal is online and I'm very happy he could, he could join us. Uh, so we, we had joint interest for conservation and also curiosity about what the Gannets were doing. So about 15 years ago, we, we started a, a long-term study. Since um, GPSs were, were brand new and, and available, the first thing we did was to, um, to deploy GPS tags on, on the birds. And, um, and we, we showed that they, they were, during the breeding season, really taking uh, their food from the, the Western English Channel. So, uh, so they, they stayed within this area, and, and hence they had to live of the, uh, the regional resources. So here you have one color uh, per, per bird uh, doing trips uh, between uh, Cotentin uh, and Cornwall. And, and sometimes the bird go all the way to, uh, to Jushin, but they seldom go into the, the Western Atlantic. So they depend on the resources there. There was nothing special 
um, about that data set. But then when we, we looked a bit more into detail, we, we found some, some fairly uh, worrying signals. Um, what we did is that we plotted uh, the foraging trip duration of, of the birds for the, uh, the gannet breeding colonies, which we knew in the UK and Ireland and Ruzik, uh, in relationship to the, the square root of colony size. And what you, what you find here is, is a nice relationship between colony size and the time the birds spend at sea. And, and that's logical. If you come from a really big colony like Bass Rock, uh, because of intraspecific competition, you have to go farther to, uh, to get your food. So most, most um, colonies were in line. But when you looked at Ruzik, it was much higher than the others. So, so that means that for a colony of this size, the birds were really staying a long time at sea, nearly double what you would expect. Um, and in, in the 2006 paper, we wrote in the discussion uh, that we, we were worried that the birds were already working really hard and that if anything would happen with marine resources uh, in the channel, uh, they would be in trouble. And at the time I thought, well, you, I wrote this, but I thought, well, you know, we, we speculate quite a lot. Uh, maybe actually they're doing fine. And, and it was the general opinion. The colony was still growing. Uh, everything seemed to be fine. What, what were the birds uh, feeding on? Uh, they, the, the gannets, what, what they love are pelagic fish, uh, especially mackerel. Um, and uh, whenever there is mackerel in the system, they, they go for that uh, resource, uh, which is fatty and uh, high in energy. And especially for their growing chicks, um, it provides all the nutrients they, uh, they need to grow and, and get uh, clever as, as gannets. Um, but we, we had the impression that this, this uh, resource was becoming limiting in the Western English Channel uh, because gradually the, the gannets we were sitting were taking more and more uh, fishery waste. Uh, so fishery waste, it was not always uh, uh, gannet as on, on, this, on this picture. Um, it was often bottom dwelling fish like gurnets or, or heads or bits of, of fish. And, um, and so we, we wondered, you know, whether the gannets could live well on this fishery waste, which was really abundant in the, in the English Channel. But with the new EU directive, we knew that uh, gradually there would be less and less of this resource. Um, because at least, you know, the plan uh, before Brexit was, was that uh, all the ships should bring everything that they get um, back, to, back to land. So we were, we were curious about two things, um, wh whether you know, the gannets could sustain themselves on existing resources and, and whether you know, this resource fish discards uh, would be profitable for them. Uh, to, so to cut a long story short, we, we studied this for about uh, 15 years uh, using tracking and diet analysis and stable isotopic analysis and also body condition analysis on, uh, on the adult gannets. And uh, what we found was, was quite worrying. So we, we found that the, there was a tendency to use more and more fish discards. Uh, but when, when the birds were using these fish discards, actually they were working harder in terms of their, of their foraging effort to uh, get this resource. And um, even more worrying, uh, gradually and across the years, they, they were losing in body condition. They were not only losing in, uh, in body mass uh, corrected for structural size, but also their uh, pectoral muscle thickness was shrinking. We measured this uh, using a portable uh, echograph on, on the birds. And, um, and, and, I, and I thought originally uh, that we wouldn't find a trend, but, but there was a, a, a significant trend. So they, they were losing uh, muscle mass. And, and physiologists like Eve know uh, what it says about a seabird when it starts to, to lose uh, mus muscle mass, that means that it has exhausted uh, already its lipid resources. So fa fairly worrying signals, which were combined with a, a reduced reproductive success for the birds. And for the first time, the colony stopped growing and then, and then it reached a, a plateau phase um, at around 20,000 uh, pairs. I was, I was worried about this um, because at, at the same time, uh, we had been working in South Africa on Cape Gannets, uh, so the, the southern cousins of the, of the northern Gannets. And there we had uh, fairly massive evidence 
uh, that uh, fisheries were taking too much small pelagic fish and effectively starving seabirds um, in the Benguela upwelling, especially the, the, the Cape Canets and the, and the African penguins. So I had the feeling that you know, what I was seeing in South Africa uh, was, was more or less predicting what would happen in, in Brittany uh, fairly soon. So we, we communicated uh, about, uh, about these results through a uh, dépêche uh, from the AFP in early 2017, uh, which made headlines saying that you know, the, the Northern Gannets and also the puffins uh, everyone wanted to see in, in Brittany and which were the emblem were actually threatened by an issue with the food base in, in the channel because that was the conclusion of what we, we were finding. And, and promptly, about two, two days later, I got a very angry letter from the, from the fishing lobby, um, which says it's a, it's a bit long, but you know, I, I can't cut what they wrote because otherwise they'll sue me. So it, it says, translated in English, we would be particularly interested concerning the abundances of gannets and puffin prey, and more generally the abundances of fish in the Western English Channel, in knowing the information sources which lead you as a scientist to express the opinion of a rarefaction of resources in the Western English Channel and leading you to conclude that commercial fisheries are its origin. So, um, so that, that means that um, at the management level, fisheries are still uh, in denial about uh, potential issues with resources. And when you come up with the information which comes from the seabird saying, well, we have a seabird here, the Northern Gannet. It's very flexible, it's very resilient. It can feed on many things and still it's starving. So we think there's a problem with marine resources. You know, on the other side, people still ask for data and you say, well, information from seabirds, that's, that's actually the data. So that was at the management level. Um, and uh, when, when we, we started digging more into the, the, the fish side of the story, we, we realized uh, two things. One was that because of uh, climate change and global warming, uh, the mackerel populations were shifting northwards. Um, and uh, here I could two, uh, two, two studies um, which determined this and also modeled uh, how mackerel stocks are vanishing to the north. Uh, that makes the bounty of uh, gannets, for instance, in Iceland. And I actually predict that northern gannets will probably breed in southwest Greenland very soon because they, they, they follow the mackerel. But that leaves um, French northern gannets in the channel with a lack of, of that resource. And, um, and to make uh, matters worse, actually immediately after we, we published our study, ICES, so the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, so that's this venerable uh, institution in Copenhagen which studies fish stocks, they finally admitted that there was a major problem with mackerel stocks being overexploited by fisheries and that there were quotas for uh, mackerel, but that in the last decade, they had been massively overshot in the whole of the Eastern Atlantic. So, so there we, we had finally an element showing that, you know, the signals we were getting from the, Gana, from the Ganets were for real. There was a, a rarefaction of that resource of the, of the mackerel, also because of, um, of overfishing. And, and actually that, uh, that overfishing led, for instance, the uh, Marine Stewards Council of threatening of withdrawing uh, its, its label for the mackerel fishery uh, in, in the area. And the saddest thing, which I only learned uh, fairly recently, is that uh, this, uh, this mackerel, which is being fished in the area, two thirds of it is not to go on the food market and for, for us to eat mackerel, but two thirds of it is to make a fish meal and fish oil. Uh, to then feed uh, poultry or, or farm the or farm salmon. Um, at, at the bases uh, in, in Normandy and Brittany, actually fishermen were well aware that, uh, that there was a problem with the resource because when um, Amélie Lescroix during her postdoc interviewed some of them and, uh, and showed these tracks uh, of the gannets in, uh, in uh, 2014, it was, it was a particularly poor year and you see that the gannets were going much farther than usual, even uh, in, in the Eastern Channel, trying to find some food. So when, when the fishermen saw this, he said, well, uh, no, no wonder, this, this year there's, there's nothing anywhere. And, and the, birds, the birds struggle as we struggle. Um, 
And, and that leads on to the idea I'll, I'll develop again later of a, of a joint destiny uh, between the, the fishermen and the seabirds. So it's not, it's not fishermen versus seabirds, you know, it's everyone in one boat trying to, uh, to extract resources uh, from, uh, from the sea. That's all during the, the breeding season. Uh, but uh, the, um, the paper we're about to publish uh, now focuses on the interbreeding season because we, we realize that you know, working during the breeding season is only one part of the story and we were curious about the, the interbreeding season. To go back to, uh, to Nelson and Nelson's book, because there's this saying in the UK, Nelson, Nelson knew it. Uh, but in, uh, in, in that instance, he, he was not completely right because he, he wrote gannet migration is not clearly separable from dispersal. And, and until recently, there, there was indeed this, this idea that outside of the breeding season, the, the seabirds, they just disperse at sea um, and they don't, do, they don't do proper migration. Uh, well, now, uh, because of, of GLSs, of course, we know that you know, there are migration corridors and migration routes at sea uh, for seabirds, just as for, for landbirds. And, uh, and again, it's where we no exception. So where, when we followed with GLSs from Rosic Islands, um, I, I picked here one year as an example, uh, but we started this in 2006. So we, um, we found, and this was coherent with ring recoveries, that the, the gannets could stay in the area and around the British Isles. Actually, we, we had individuals uh, going first in autumn in the, in the Celtic Sea, the Irish Sea, and then all around the UK, uh, Orkney for Christmas, uh, and then coming back to, to breed in January, February to Rosic. So some of them were staying very local, um, but a, a big part of them were migrating to West Africa and, uh, and a small portion, not in all years, but uh, um, half of the years, some birds were flying into the Mediterranean um, and, and quite, quite far all, all the way uh, to Lebanon, for instance. And they were also, these individuals, they were faithful to, uh, to, their, wintering, uh, to their wintering areas. Um, but as I said, you know, a big part were migrating to West Africa together with shearwaters, screwers, and, and quite a few other, other seabirds, which come uh, to spend the winter month in this highly productive upwelling uh, of the canary of, of the canary plant. Um, we uh, we followed adults, but we also followed uh, um, nestlings, so juveniles on their first flight. Um, so here you have uh, the wintering areas of adults followed by GLS. Uh, these are the sort of reddish contours. And the juveniles, on the juveniles, we had uh, a GPS with uh, Argos relay, so much more precise. Uh, and there you see that the juveniles, they also uh, hug the coast uh, on their migration to, uh, to West Africa. Um, but interestingly, some of them, they, they really explore the, the area here before they, before they go south. Uh, so at the population level, uh, West, West Africa was really uh, an, an important place. But what happened in this GLS uh, tracking study is that over the years, uh, our recovery rates of GLS has completely crashed. So that means that um, and, and here you have the, uh, the recycling rates of the GLS equipped birds uh, and the years since deployment uh, for the birds equipped in 2006 and then uh, 2014 as an example. And when we started this, um, one year after deploying the GLSs, we would see again nearly all, all the birds, uh, 90%. And then 10 years later, it completely crashed and we were seeing only 10% of the birds back. Initially, we thought, well, we are messing this up completely. I don't know what we're doing with the rings. Uh, maybe they lose the rings, or we don't manage to recite them. So I, I, I really thought we were messing it up with uh, our field protocol. But after a few years, we realized, no, they're just not coming back. Um, and uh, we, we started to wonder what was happening. And fortunately, at the, at the same time, uh, Amélie Descreux and Pascal Provo uh, started uh, a mark recapture study, uh, which hadn't yet been done uh, for northern gannets on, on music. And, and there are actually few of these studies, interestingly, for northern gannets as, as a whole. 
And, uh, and after a few years, we realized that the same was happening. So that means that the, uh, the survival probability we were calculating uh, for um, Uzi Guinness was, was declining quite, quite sharply. Uh, so you can see here, we, we still have a, a survival probability, which is fairly normal uh, for, sea, for seabirds. And then it, it declines to uh, less than 0.5. Um, so Aurélien Bénard at, at CEF did this, this analysis. And then when I, when I showed this data set to Christophe Barbo here at, at the CBC, he, uh, he looked at it and he said, yeah, th this, this colony has a problem, has a, a survival problem. And um, we, we designed uh, various hypotheses to, to try and understand what was going on. So we, we had showed that uh, there was a vanishing prey bed. So we knew that this could affect body condition and, and hence affect survival. But really in such, mass, in such a massive way, it seemed, uh, it seemed unlikely. The other thing we considered was the possibility for birds of uh, dying in the winter because of oiling and, and winter storms. And uh, oiling had been, had been an issue historically in, in Brittany with, with major oiling events. Um, so we, we looked at this and here is the uh, number of oil gannets uh, which are being taken uh, care of at, at the Il Grand uh, bird, um, bird Lab. And uh, as you can see here, you have a peak with uh, Erika oil spill, but, uh, but ev ever since and across the last two decades, uh, num numbers are, are fairly low. Uh, so we don't think that oiling is a problem and we don't think also that gannets uh, die in, in winter storms. Uh, although, you know, I, I, would, I would be really keen to have the, the advice of uh, our colleagues from uh, Pelagis uh, and, and Jens in this matter, because I, I know they've been working on, on the issue, but uh, we, we didn't consider this as a, a major cause of death. There, there, was, there were also pathogens and, and parasites, um, and, and it's true that at some colonies, uh, especially in North America, there were recorded cases of Newcastle disease virus, and also uh, uh, meningoencephalitis uh, for, for gannets, but none of this had been seen in, in Europe. So that, that deserves more work, uh, but we, we didn't regard this as a, as a likely cause. And then came bycatch. And, uh, and as, as Christophe Barbo told me, well, bycatch with such a, a decline in your adult survival rates, bycatch is, is the most likely cause because it has been shown, especially in petrol and albatrosses, of, of causing um, a, lot, a lot of damage. And, uh, and this is where we, we started to look a little more at what was going on in, in West Africa. Um, and, and actually, I'm, I'm lying here because I knew already for a few years uh, that you know, there was a problem with West Africa and, and fishery. It had been identified um, as, as a major hotspot for international fisheries. Um, especially Asian, but also um, vessels from uh, Europe, from the European Union, taking a lot of fish there. And also it had become uh, notorious as a, as a major um, illegal fishing uh, hotspot. And, uh, and, and the, way, the way it works um, is that from, from Asia and also from the European Union, states uh, buy fishing rights uh, to West African countries. Uh, so a part of it is legal, but uh, once the vessels are there, uh, there's too little surveillance and enforcement to actually ensure that uh, fisheries are performed as they should be. So, so basically, once you're there, it's, uh, it's open bar. Um, and and uh, so there, there are attempts of uh, African countries to control the situation, but with uh, very uh, limited resources. And for instance, here you have a a Liberian Coast Guard um, trying to arrest a Dutch um, uh, vessel of the, the coast uh, of the coast of, of Liberia, and uh, this this fisheries they are mainly offshore fisheries uh, going for for tuna, uh, but then from international waters they make they make a course into national waters and they and they take everything, um, and and this, the second. Worrying thing is that lots of these fisheries, not only international, but also the thousands of pyrogues, uh, especially in, in Senegal, they now work not for subsistence fishing, but to feed uh, the large fishing factories 
uh, which are being uh, established. These fish factories, they were, they've been there for a long time in, in Senegal, um, but uh, they, they were supposed to treat uh, fishery refuse. Uh, but now dozens of them are being constructed, especially in, uh, in Mauritania. And, uh, and, and a big part of the fishing activity there on Sardinella is, is there to, uh, to, do, to do fish meal. Um, so this, this fish is taken away from African people who uh, could be eating them. Um, and of course, you know, when the gannets and other seabirds uh, arrive in the area for winter, they are deprived of, of that food. Of that food. Um, to, um, to make matters worse, um, as, as you know, there, there has been a, really a run for wild flavor and, uh, and African species uh, on Eastern Asian uh, markets. And, uh, and, and the way it, it, it works that people want to have these species very often uh, endangered, uh, not only from terrestrial habitats, as, as we heard a lot about, you know, the pangolin and, and uh, potentially the crisis which leads us now to be with mast in, in, uh, in this room, but also it may concern marine species, uh, sharks, turtles, and uh, more recently, uh, seabirds, uh, because we, we discovered that um, at least two loads of container ships uh, had been seized by uh, Mauritanian authorities. Um, and these, uh, these, con these containers uh, were containing seabirds. So these were mainly uh, uh, shearwaters and gannets, and uh, they were plucked, um, beheaded in, in fish boxes ready to, uh, to go to, um, to Asia to, to land on these more or less illegal uh, food markets. And we discussed with the, uh, the BirdLife International uh, representative for China. Um, and, and he said that uh, sadly, they, they hadn't managed to, uh, to see on which markets you know, these seabirds are being sold. You know, China is a really big country. So we, we don't know where, where these seabirds vanish, but uh, they are really worried that uh, it's not only bycatch, you know, it's seabirds being caught on purpose uh, to, to be then uh, leaked to, um, to food markets. Uh, and as, as a bird life representative said, well, you know, if, if these markets discover that you can also harvest seabirds, you know, that's, that's the end of uh, also many, uh, many petrol species. Um, so we, we think that for the, uh, for the northern gannets of, of Ruzik, uh, even though they are protected where, where they, they breed, that you know, there are serious issues uh, with the marine environment they are living in, uh, issues with uh, the food resources uh, they should be living in on, and, and also um, a, a, a bycatch, uh, and not only bycatch, may, may be intentional capture of these birds um, of, uh, of West Africa. So, so we, we, we think that through, through this study, we showed that even for a highly resilient, uh, resilient seabird as the northern gannet, you know, there are really limits and, and the species is coming to, uh, to these limits. I must say here that what, what we find for the Rosic gannetry is fairly unusual because our colleagues in the UK, they, they don't have similar results. Um, and, uh, and that's fairly puzzling at the moment because you know, the, also the survival rates they get for the gannets are much higher than what we get. Uh, but my worry is that you know, their time series are shorter than the ones we have, and, and also they are less recent. So maybe similar things are happening and, and they haven't detected it yet. The, the, the second thing is, is that although my, my story obviously is um, a, a, size, a, a sad story, you know, there, are, there are positive aspects to it. Because the gannet is such an emblem, uh, especially in France, uh, managers like Pascal Provo uh, can use the evidence we're creating uh, to then push for conservation action. And, uh, and specifically what Pascal is, is, is trying to get at the moment is a marine extension uh, of the, the Settil uh, Nature Reserve, uh, or at least an area uh, with, uh, with no marine traffic around uh, the, uh, the, the colony during the, the, the breeding season. And, uh, and also the tracking data we collect is being used um, to, uh, to define no-take zones in, uh, in, in the English Channel. Uh, and I would say that's, that's a fairly classic rationale you know, with, with the way we see seabird conservation. 
but but in in more broad terms, uh, I, I think this this story uh, to me is fairly symptomatic of of a global world uh, which is threatening both seabirds um, and also vulnerable humans. Um, if you take the case of the uh, of the northern gannets, they they breed in in Brittany where they are protected at their breeding sites, but then they come to West Africa where they are exposed to overfishing and illegal harvest. And, uh, and some of it is caused by EU vessels. So the European Union, while you know, it is putting a lot of money into protecting biodiversity in Europe, is at the same time subsidizing activities, uh, which is trashing the same species uh, a few thousand uh, kilometers further south. If you take the opposite uh, perspective, uh, we, we know that desertification caused by climate change and also problem with, with land use and access to land is pushing a lot of young people um, away and into coastal areas of West Africa. So lots of, lots of um, African fishermen, <clears throat> they are first generation fishermen. They come from, from inland and they come pushed to the coast because there's nothing inland left to, to farm. So, uh, so fi fishing is, a, is an occupation of, of last resort to them. Because these marine resources are depleted, these, these guys, they are precisely the guys which uh, get on boats then in, in Dakar and in Senegal and, and try to make it for the, the canneries and, and drown at sea. Um, and, and overfishing in the area is, is also one of the reasons why you know, they, they, they make this, uh, this desperate move. So, uh, so the, 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 the story I'm telling is about these ecological solidarities. Uh, and, and when you have to consider the system as, as a whole, uh, not only for, for the sake of the, of the seabirds and, and the messages they carry, but uh, also for, for that of, uh, of the people. Um, so this, this being said, I'll, um, I'll leave you with Niall uh, acknowledgements to, uh, to the funders of, uh, of this long-term study and, uh, and the, uh, the colleagues who participated, you, you all know uh, very well. Um, I thank again Pascal Provo for, for being with us and then uh, we'll be taking questions from, from here and also for, from people online. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, thanks first. Oh, nice. Oh, I don't know if you can say that. <laughs> so impressive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talking about the Chinese market and not knowing where the bird go, do you have any discussion with the, the bird life people to try to put some trackers in to, to know like the, what they use on on, uh, on on seals to see how they die, where they die. Yes, so, so the, the, the problem is that the proportion of birds which are effectively taken um, is, is still you know, not, not huge or be, better to say, you know, we, we, we still don't know the proportion of birds which are taken uh, intentionally and those which just die at high catch. Uh, that's, that's a problem. So one of the funders here of the uh, of study is, is Mava. Uh, through the Alcyon uh, project in West Africa. And they are based in Dakar. And uh, the, the first thing you know, they, are, they are trying to implement together with NGOs is to have uh, observers um, uh, to, to try to see exactly what's happening, uh, you know, with the difficulty of, of trying to put observers on, on uh, fishing vessels with illegal activities. Uh, and, and also you probably heard about, you know, all the, the issues with more modern slavery on on these uh, on these vessels, so it's a it's a very tricky thing to do. But yeah, in principle, that's uh, that's an, that's an idea. But you will you would still be to be very lucky to manage to get a, a signal. But yeah. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you had any ideas about the wintering locations for the British uh, birds. Yes. Um, Okay, so um, yes, the, uh, the birds from the British Isles, they also go to West Africa. Uh, so they would be exposed to, uh, to the same level of bycatch. 
But I must say one difference with the Ruzi colony I didn't mention is the fact that they go into the Mediterranean. Uh, and, and apparently uh, Ghanets from the UK don't do this, or at least those which have been tracked. And another side of the story is that there's also a bycatch problem uh, in the Mediterranean in, in, some, in some areas. Um, for instance, off the coast of, of Morocco, uh, working on, on shear waters, my Spanish colleagues, they, they really found a, a bycatch hotspot. Uh, and, and we know that there are issues also for Spanish waters. And there's a program ongoing now for France to try and understand the levels of bycatch. But there could be also bycatch in, in the Mediterranean. And then we, uh, we lack data on this. And worryingly, you know, the fraction of gannets from Ruzik, which fly into the Mediterranean, has completely declined. Uh, so we don't know whether we just lost these birds or, or whether it's, it's, a, it's a change in, in the last few years. The problem is that the, the recapture rate of the GLS now is so low that we stopped deploying them because you know, we, we couldn't continue throwing out uh, GLSs uh, each year and, and getting maybe one back. Just another question. I, I, I was also wondering, do you have a long-term uh, time series about stabilized positive nature for those birds? Yes. And is there any changes? No. Uh, so <laughs> I, I didn't present this data, but it's part of a, of a paper which is in press. Uh, so the, 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 it's um, data on, uh, on blood and feathers. Uh, and uh, it's analyzed by Jérôme Fouratliens. And what it shows is that outside of the breeding season, there's no trend for the surviving birds. That's always a problem. So for the surviving birds, there's no trend, but this signature is compatible with the use of small pelagic fish. And uh, so, so that means that the survivors, uh, when they go to West Africa, they seem to be still finding some uh, small pelagic fish but also they compete with the local fisheries. Yeah. Actually, uh, it can be of use uh, because I, one interesting thing is the, the root ring pattern. It seems that, uh, well, you said most of them are simply root patterns, but some of them are going to root ring that explain the pattern of the state of the North Sea. And uh, well, the first question would be, do you know why some birds have that strategy? And the reason uh, for being optimistic is that if you have a very high bycatch in the North Sea, uh, maybe the other wintering population uh, will survive if they don't face some bycatch. And so you could have a lot of more frequent survival than the others. But at some stage, if these other individuals wintering in other areas, Yes, yeah, so a selection for, for a specific yeah. ecotype. So you would you would select a, an ecotype which would then uh, su survive. Yeah, that's uh, that's one uh, that's one possibility. And al also, I think that we only have one side of the story because uh, if survival would decline so much, actually the the, the colony should empty fairly rapidly. Uh, even though you know we know that there's a, a large volume of non-breeders which make a buffer and you wonder how long this buffer will, will last uh, but fact is you know the the colony is not massively declining uh, it's just stabilizing instead of, of growing and and some years declining uh, declining slightly uh, and also what i didn't mention is uh, is that uh, you also have an incidence of uh, local uh, local climate and especially uh, heat waves during the breeding season or, or uh, big uh, rain events. And, and those had uh, a, a strong incidence on, on breeding success. So you, you also have to take uh, this, into, uh, this into account. But you have an idea of why some birds have the Mediterranean, other ones are staying north, or are there any differences in the spectrum sequence? Or no, we we couldn't find we couldn't find the trends. Uh, but having said that, you know, we um, for the different groups, then you're talking about fairly small sample sizes, uh, and then of course with the problem that now you know the birds they simply do not come back. So it's it's hard to build up a, a large data set to test uh, this sort of ideas. Uh, but there seem to be different strategies, and as I said, 
um, and and we we, sh we showed this that there's fidelity to uh, to the wintering site. Um, so that's why I find puzzling that at once you know we we lost the Mediterranean birds. Charlie. Well, it, it's yeah. The, there is density dependence in, in that sense that you know the the resources are limited uh, in in the Western English Channel, and it was probably already the case when we tracked them in in two thousand five. Uh, because we saw, you know, that, that the, the, the foraging effort was uh, was higher than expected for a colony of this size. So I, I, I guess the I guess the, the short answer is is yes. Uh, there is certainly a density dependence during breeding. During during breeding, yeah. Out, outside of the breeding season, uh, of course, you also now have limited resources in West Africa uh, because the small pelagic fish are being taken away. Yeah, but that's correct. Do you have any information about the breeding success? Because breeding success is in a direct relationship with the feeding ecology of the birds during the season. Yeah, and that's precisely what crashed uh, from uh, 2013, 2014. So there, 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 there were really years with very low breeding success. Uh, basically, um, I hope I have the right figures, but it was like something like 75%. Uh, uh, and, and then it was cut by half within two, two or three years. The, the breeding success really crashed. And this is uh, only colony with such a crash? No. So um, in, in the UK, they're still doing well. But if you look on the other side of the Atlantic in Quebec, uh, you get very similar features. Do you have uh, other information from the other channel colony in Alzheimer's? Yes. They're, they're, they're apparently doing better. Okay. And that's, that's where it's, it's puzzling. Okay. But at the same time, uh, the, uh, the, da the data set there, A, it's, it's a much smaller colony, so you have less competition uh, between the birds, and, and, and B, you know, the, uh, the study there is less detailed, especially in, in terms of breeding success. So it's hard, so it's hard to compare. And did they track the birds? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there was another lab or not? No. 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 They they go they go further eastwards. Okay. Yeah. Very little overlap. Thank you. And what about the dispersal? Do you see uh, yep. a different have these fingers up north? So, yeah. Could it be that they just follow the Well, I think ultimately the birds will, will move, uh, but you, you know, the, the gannets, they are extremely faithful to, to their breeding colony. So uh, that's clearly something also we, we discuss in, in the paper. So the, there is a, a small proportion of dispersal, but to a level which could never explain, uh, you know, the, the differences we find in return rates and, and apparent uh, survival rates. So there, there is some, some dispersal based on ring recoveries, but uh, very little. So it's a it's a very uh, philopatric species. And do you have an idea from a historical perspective that Gallagher that happened before, so that they are the class because of the and then we are it's going back to normal in a way. That after being you know, the steep increase because of the fish and then they you know they are doing again the I think it's difficult to, to, to get uh, uh, definite abundances from, from the past and, and from the historical times. Uh, what, what you get, you know, are bone remains uh, from, uh, from archaeological sites. Uh, but Even from the past work, uh, very old mm, oh yeah, well, uh, do, do you, it, it depends on which uh, on which time uh, uh, scale you, you you think. But uh, no, we we looked we looked at this uh, for 
all seabirds from the UK and Ireland um, about 15 years ago. And we looked at historical data going back to the mid 19th century. And if you go back to the mid 19th century, then you know numbers were very low for, for all seabirds because they were hunted everywhere. And then, and then you really see that, that recovery of the, of the whole community, uh, which, which then starts to, uh, to crash in, in the 21st century. Um, so there, there is clearly a, a carrying capacity of, uh, of the system. Uh, but if at the same time, you, know, you have demonstrated um, over how, well, overfishing of, of resources, you know, you, in a way, you know what's limiting the seabed population. I wonder if there, if there are any questions online or whether Pascal Provo is still with us and uh, would like to say something. Tu es encore avec nous, Pascal? Yes, I hear you. <laughs> Salut, Pascal. Tu peux, Salut. tu peux aussi nous dire quelques mots en, en français sur ta perspective de gestionnaire et, et l'extension marine, si tu veux. Oui, en deux, trois mots, euh, que, en fait, voilà, la collaboration euh, ne date pas d'hier, elle est très riche entre le CNRS et la LPO, et que on, la recherche, la science, évidemment, euh, contribue à la conservation euh, de, des oiseaux marins, en l'occurrence le fou de bassin. Euh, effectivement, on a mis à profit euh, quelques jeux de données pour euh, euh, étendre et justifier l'extension le, euh, de la réserve des Sétiles, qui devrait euh, du coup occuper une surface de 15 000 hectares et aujourd'hui elle fait 300 hectares. Donc maintenant ça ne résout pas tous les problèmes de conservation des communautés d'oiseaux marins, mais voilà c'est une, une petite un petit coup de pouce supplémentaire et notamment euh, on a défini une zone de quiétude pour le repos euh, des fous de bassin au nord de la colonie. Et sinon, par rapport aux, aux, aux conclusions générales en termes de conservation, euh, euh, je ne sais pas si vous, si tu avais d'autres commentaires à faire ou si, ou si ce que j'avais pu dire correspondait à ta vision des choses ou alors si Non, c'est toute la difficulté, en fait, c'est euh, à, à quelle échelle on se situe et, et finalement, on ne maîtrise pas tout, loin de là, dans la conservation, évidemment. Euh, L'île Rousic, euh, la colonie s'est installée en 1939. Euh, elle a été dératisée, donc éradication des rats sur le en 1951. Elle fait l'objet d'une protection stricte et donc sans débarquement depuis des décennies. Euh, maintenant, évidemment, on est démuni en tant que gestionnaire parce qu'on se rend compte que les problématiques de conservation vont euh, se poser jusqu'en Afrique de l'Ouest et tu l'as très bien démontré. Euh, donc maintenant, tout, tout l'enjeu est de créer des coopérations internationales et de faire des publications et que ces publications soient relayées euh, au, plus haut, au plus haut niveau. Voilà, maintenant, euh, on s'efforce, nous, à notre niveau, euh, de faire le maximum et, et après, euh, notamment de définir ces zones de protection fortes autour des colonies, comme ça a été fait au Pays de Bas ou enfin, au, au Pays de Galles, par exemple. Maintenant, on a affaire aussi à des contextes politiques et avec des enjeux socio-économiques qui pèsent sur les politiques de conservation. Et je te remercie, David, parce qu'on a besoin des publications, des projets de recherche pour étayer un peu nos, nos mesures de conservation. Merci bien. J'avais une question pour Pascal. Est-ce que justement le fait d'avoir des, des publications qui montrent que l'enjeu il n'est peut-être pas toujours au niveau du local, mais des fois à l'international, est-ce que ça, ça t'a posé le problème pour, pour défendre des projets de, de conservation locaux Alors oui, c'est sûr que c'est moins entendable pour des, la population du Trégor, du Nord-Bretagne, que euh, de, de considérer finalement les pratiques de conservation à large échelle comme ça. Mais c'est quelque chose qui les intéresse de près. Et notamment, moi, je, je vois le lien que l'on peut faire avec la communauté des pêcheurs côtiers, et non pas forcément la pêche futuria, mais euh, qui, a, qui a un destin commun, en fait. Moi, je, 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 
David a parlé de la solidarité écologique. Je pense qu'on a tout intérêt, euh, même si c'est à une échelle locale, à, à, à vulgariser ces connaissances et à co-construire les projets. On a beaucoup de projets menés avec les pêcheurs pro, euh, nous, à notre échelle, mais euh, ça ne veut pas dire que euh, finalement qu'on doit mettre de côté le reste et les enjeux très forts de la pêche futurière, les pêches accidentelles, etc., les captures accidentelles. Euh, moi, je pense qu'il euh, faut, euh, faut tout mettre sur la table et être très transparent vis-à-vis -vis de tous ces jeux de données et, et les populations, euh, en tout cas, nous, nous le territoire, les, les acteurs sont, sont, oui, oui, sont, assez, sont assez réceptifs. Merci. Oui, alors, il y a une question. Euh, on parle de la, des bycatch, euh, soit en Afrique par exemple, mais euh, la, la pêche côtière euh, en France, avec euh, beaucoup d'informations sur les bycatch, euh, on va les grandir en Bretagne et on sait bien que dans le racin, euh, les meilleurs pour le bar, ils capturent des coups, des coups, comme ils capturer, même s'il n'y a pas de nombre. Et, est-ce que localement, vous avez des informations Est-ce que c'est quelque chose que vous écoutiez pour savoir un peu les interactions avec la pêche en local ouais, ben, en, en fait, là, je vais laisser Pascal rajouter quelque chose, mais la, la photo que je montre d'un fou avec un hameçon, c'est de, de Rosic. Hein. Donc, euh, et, et ça peut être de la pêche récréative, euh, ça, ça, ça peut être de la pêche pro-côtière. Euh, donc oui, on, on sait qu'il y, y a des événements de capture et c'est extrêmement dur à, à quantifier. Euh, et pareil en Méditerranée, en fait. Et, et en, en, en Méditerranée, en fait, les, les pêcheurs pro se retranchent derrière l'idée qu'ils euh, n'utilisent pas les mêmes techniques que les Espagnols et moins de palandres. Euh, donc, il n'y a, a pas de capture accidentelle, mais on l'a bien vu pendant le, le confinement. Euh, le premier confinement, euh, je pense à un moment aussi où tout ce qui était surveillance était vachement relâché, mais il y avait quand même de la pêche. Il y a eu un événement de capture euh, massif euh, de, de puffins au large de la Camargue, et, euh, et c'était sur des, sur des palandres, hein. et c'était un, un, un pêcheur pro. Mais c'est dur... Euh, c'est dur à quantifier. Après, d'un point de vue formel et au niveau des dynamiques populationnelles, je pense que c'est assez passionnant parce que c'est des, des événements euh, ponctuels euh, avec une incidence énorme sur, euh, sur la survie des, des adultes. Bon, je, mais je pense que c'est difficile à, à quantifier. Après, spécifiquement pour les, les, les fous dans leur environnement côtier, Pascal, euh, tu avais des choses à dire sur les, les captures accidentelles plus en, en local Non, je confirme hein, le, les métiers de l'hameçon. Euh, aussi bien la pêche de loisirs que la pêche pro, potentiellement, oui, on peut, il peut y avoir des, des, voilà, des captures accidentelles. On a quelques cas, effectivement, euh, et cette photo euh, provient de, de notre territoire. Donc, euh, maintenant, on, une aire marine protégée comme la nôtre, elle se, droit, elle se doit d'être exemplaire. Euh, il y a des programmes qui sont portés au niveau national sur les, sur les liens entre la pêche pro et les habitats d'intérêt communautaire. Dans quelques années, ce sera le cas pour les espèces. On, il ne faut pas attendre forcément qu'il y ait ces mesures-là pour essayer de quantifier. Euh, donc voilà, donc on a euh, dans le projet d'extension aussi l'idée d'évaluer de manière euh, très précise un peu euh, ces interactions avec euh, la pêche euh, au sens large. J'ai une autre petite question sur, sur la pêche à l'hameçon en Bretagne, parce que l'hameçon que tu montres là sur la photo, à mon avis, ça, ce n'est pas la pêche au macro. Hein. Et donc... Euh, si on trouve que des hameçons qui ont servi à la pêche au macro, ben ça, ça va se voir. On va les trouver sur les oiseaux et on saura que c'est de la pêche au macro. Là, c'est plutôt de la palandre et plutôt même de la palandre sans doute démersale. Donc, je suppose que ça n'a pas, pas un impact formidable sur les oiseaux. Je, 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 parlais, mais, mais, je parlais métier hameçon au sens large. Hein. Je n'ai pas euh, euh, précisé que macro, mais effectivement, c'est la mitraillette, etc. Enfin, il y a plein de, de pêches. Et, oui, oui, et la palangre, la palangre notamment, oui. Mais sachant que le, le, le gros des captures de, de macro qui sont une pêche euh, hivernale et en partie pour faire des farines de poisson, euh, ce n'est pas à la maison que ça se pêche. Hein. Non, mais le récréatif Ah, bah, bien sûr, oui. C'est de la mitraillette ou Oui, oui. Ou oui, en hier et, donc, et en, et en très côtier. Ouais. Ouais. Oui, oui. Et c'est là où il peut y avoir des guirlandes de fou. Euh. Bon, très bien. Eh ben, je ne sais pas, pas, pas s'il y avait d'autres questions en ligne ou euh, une pers personne n'a levé la main. Par rapport à l'ère marine protégée, c'est pour Pascal. Est-ce que euh, dans cette aire, il y aura des restrictions pour la pêche 
Est-ce qu'il y en aura Et si oui, est-ce que ce sera sur la pêche au petit pélagie Alors, sur, sur les 15 000 hectares, euh, donc c'est un tout petit territoire finalement par rapport au home range euh, du fou, euh, on, a défini, on a défini simplement euh, 130 hectares, euh, essentiellement au nord de Rousic, en, en zone de quiétude, donc pendant cinq mois, du 1er avril au 31 août. Euh, donc, c'est une zone de protection forte. Maintenant, je peux vous dire que rien n'est fait. Euh, il y a tout un circuit. Euh, évidemment, ça va être après au niveau rang ministériel. Le décret, il n'est pas passé. Ce sera courant 2022, mais ça reste modeste. Euh, mais malgré tout, c'est quand même très compliqué à mettre en œuvre. Euh, donc, voilà, maintenant, il n'y aura pas. Par contre, il y aura toute une surveillance et une politique de suivi et de surveillance police de l'environnement à l'échelle des 15 000 hectares. Et, et donc, euh, voilà, on ira un peu plus fin dans les connaissances. Et voilà, maintenant, il n'y a pas que le foot-bassin, il y a la population de macareux, euh, d'océanique, etc., de cormorans up de goélands. Euh, il y a 11 espèces d'oiseaux marins, dont une communauté vraiment qui dépend de, de, de cette qualité d'environnement marin, les phoques gris, etc. Donc, maintenant, voilà, ce, on, on pourra guère aller au-delà, mais je pense que… Euh, on n'a jamais eu véritablement de frontière entre les 280 hectares et, et puis euh, nous, les, les, le, tout ce qui est périphérique à la réserve. Et, et vraiment, l'enjeu, le, voilà, c'est là, pour le coup, le lien euh, recherche-gestion, il, il a tout son intérêt parce qu'on euh, peut dépasser largement nos frontières avec ce genre d'études et, et euh, du coup, euh, euh, faire valoir ces, ces connaissances pour la conservation. Moi, je suis vraiment admiratif vis-à-vis -vis du travail de, de Pascal parce que réussir à… À, à, à mettre en place cette extension marine, c'est 10 ans de travail et, euh, et, et je dirais des activités euh, diplomatiques euh, dont moi je, je serais jamais capable. C'est euh, juste incroyable ce que ça met en branle pour, pour, euh, pour parvenir à, à protéger ce type, ce type d'espace en métropole. C'est juste, juste incroyable. Oui, parce que... et, je suis, et je suis vraiment admiratif. Juste essayer de maîtriser un peu la pêche, ne serait-ce que récréative au macro, c'est très, très compliqué. Et quel est l'enjeu de l'eau, je dirais, par rapport à ces pêches ouais, Alors, donc, il y a. Ouais, oui, oui. Il y a un parc éolien euh, qui va être mis en place euh, en baie de Saint-Brieuc, euh, donc dans une zone qui est visitée par les, les fous de bassin des, des sept îles. Tu me reprends, Pascal, si je dis des bêtises qui est visité par les, les fous de bassin des sept îles, mais pas de manière euh, massive. Euh, après, les premières études euh, d'impact des éoliennes euh, tendaient à dire que les, les fous de bassin euh, volaient bien plus bas que les, les pales des éoliennes. Euh, mais maintenant qu'il y a des données d'altimétrie de, euh, plus précises, eh ben, on sait qu'ils volent à hauteur des pales. Euh, voilà, donc euh, l'impact ne sera, sera pas nul. Il y a des études justement sur les voies internationales de l'impact éolien les... Oui, alors il y, a, il y a des études assez importantes justement pour la, la zone au large de Bass Rock en Écosse. Et nous, en fait, nos, nos données de suivi GPS, elles, elles servent en manche pour définir les, les zones les plus chaudes en termes de, de présence des fous. Et en fait, les fous de Rousic, ça je ne l'ai pas mentionné, mais ils aiment beaucoup une zone centrale en manche. Euh, qui correspond à un front de marée, donc une structure océanographique euh, euh, récurrente, très productive, qui agrège euh, euh, mammifères marins, grands poissons, euh, oiseaux marins. Euh, c'est aussi pile sur le rail de navigation, mais euh, c'est là où il y a de la productivité marine et, et c'est là où vont, où vont les fous euh, de, de manière assez constante. Est-ce que vous suivez des études D'accord. Ouais, c'est de la probabilité, ouais. ouais. 